the middle of the belt. Lucky to have the internet that right there at all. Um, he worked for Simcom for a couple of years now, and his main responsibilities are store, maintaining store, advancing store, and running a whole bunch of tests uh, by a whole bunch of him. Um, couple, of, I don't know how many thousand tests that we have, and uh, now he's talking about store beyond door and what's next on the agenda. This, this is a new thing for me. Um, I spent like 25 years in small talk, um, sort of being on the other side from the vendor, complaining about the prices and the licenses, and uh, talking about features I'd like to see, and why aren't they here already? Now, now I have to stand here and let the guy say those things to me. Um, so over the last three releases of, of um, VisualWorks, we have been working to get the old store database code out and to put all of the store functionality on top of the core. Um, this has there are a number of implications of this that I'll be talking about, and um, there are also some issues. Well. Let's put it this way, the implications are both positive and at least temporarily negative. So, okay, so at the beginning of this talk, I was thinking about this being a little bit like uh, small talk solutions, where everyone used a commercial small talk, everyone was working for a company, and I immediately realized after a couple of days, that's probably not the case. So, for those of you who already know what store is, and you have used it, bear with me. I'm going to um, try to, to offer a brief introduction for those who aren't in that situation. So, Store is a, is a version control system written in Smalltalk for Smalltalk. It provides some of the same features that, that um, NV Developer has um, in Visual Age, um, and, and I will show you some of those. Um, uses a relational database as a back end, which has some advantages and some disadvantages. And the thing that's different from most version control systems is that it independently versions things at, at a much finer level of granularity than you can usually get in version control. So we version components, but we also version methods. So you can look at the history of a method and you can see all the changes that have happened and you can compare the ones of your choice and there are ways to actually get back all the versions and basically look at them and see when they got switched out and what changes were made at each point and sometimes you can even see who did it so sometimes that can be useful so um, we provide the tools as part of the store for publishing at a, at a high level. So we, you don't publish, I mean, in any when you save a method, it's in the repository. In store, we like to keep your dirty, dirty laundry to yourself. So the half-finished methods don't go in the repository. When you have something that hopefully passes tests or you think is ready, or you want to share it, you can publish it to the repository at a package level, which is a collection of classes and um, classes, but extensions, namespaces, and so on. Or at a bundle level, which is a, a collection of packages. We provide um, tools for doing comparisons of versions. We provide tools for merging versions. Um, you can load, if, if you look at a list of versions of a method, you can choose to load a different version than the one that's currently loaded. Um, and you can do that at higher levels as well. Okay, so one of the big changes with going through the LORP is instead of having to understand the, the, the um, schema of the actual database, and really, you don't want to look at it, um, now you can do object queries using the GLORP 
query syntax. Okay, so most of you already know what Blurp is, so why don't we just skip this one? So we're used to use hard code in SQL. Um, it would have been slower if they hadn't, but it made it very rigid. Uh, one of the problems was that all the select statements were select asterisk, which means give me all the fields in the table. Um, but then in the small talk code, we had a hard coded list of fields that we expected to find. So you couldn't just go in and change the table because lots of things in lots of places would stop working. There were objects which represented pieces of of your code components, but they they were sort of data objects. Um, and to provide relate um, the ability to query on relationships, we had to use views. Okay, so now there are there's a hierarchy of store objects which are they're, they're a little bit redundantly named. Um, store dot store something, store package, store bundle, store method, and so on. Um, this is a list of the exceptions of things that are not subclass in that hierarchy. Most of these are there's there's some things for doing permissions that most people don't use, and. I really have to talk to the guy that I work with about this version of the Tundle thing. So, you can probably ignore that one. Okay, so to get objects back from store, you need a session. There's a database connection, and on top of the database connection, there's a, a Glorp session. And the, what the Glorp session allows you to do is, when you're querying, if you get an object back multiple times because of the join. This makes sure you don't have to, to um, deserialize it multiple times. So there's a cache there. So the, the database accessor is, um, this is a core object which basically manages the database connection. There's a descriptor system which manages the schema and the mapping between objects and um, and table rows and attributes. And then there's a platform, and the platform tends to hide the database-specific differences. And there's some work that we need to do there, um, and now we have a lot more reason, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so this is what a query looks like. Um, you can create queries you can create queries by telling them what kind of an object you're, you want to return, adding a where clause. However, if you have an object that has a complex object as one of its instance variables, it's likely stored in another table. And so you use also fetch to ask it to pull these other things. Otherwise, what you get is you get an uninstantiated proxy. And you can, you can resolve the proxy but if you get back 50 rows, it's better to use it a um, also fetch rather than getting them all back and then trying to get that field and doing 50 queries to just resolve a single problem. We can sort. We can also tell it, yeah, yeah, I said I wanted objects, but really just give me a field or really just give me a count or something like that. That's what these do. And we use this occasionally for things like finding um, the last timestamp for a particular package that's been committed. So here's an, here's an example to get all versions of a method. This, there's actually a class method that will execute this for you. Um, however, I modified it so you see that we were actually looking for the method file new in class workspace in package tools workspace. So there are ways to do this. If you have a method, there are ways to just say for this method, I want to see all the versions. And 
and the tools support that, but there are ways to roll your own if you have a slightly different thing that you want to do. And here's an example. Um, one of the um, one of the engineers wanted to update his image twice a day to the latest thing that had been published in the repository. And he didn't want to have to look to see what, what it would be. So he tried a naive implementation and it was much too slow. And so then we started talking about doing it in such a way that he could re reduce the number of queries and get back just what he wanted. So this particular query asks for the most recent version of the Lord. And the way that it does that without getting a branch that's part of somebody's work in progress is that it chooses the, the package name of Glor, current blessing level greater than or equal to 15 is um, blessings in store as names like development or broken or internal release or what have you. And 15 is the minimum number which is a good blessing. And this bit, this bit here basically says, I want the latest 7.9 version, and if there isn't a 7.9 version, give me the latest 7.8 version. And if there isn't one of those, give me a 7.7. And if there isn't one of those, give me a 7.7. Seven. Oh, 7.71 seven, seven, or 7.7. Seven, seven. So this allows him to get one particular, the latest version of one particular bundle with one query, regardless of which release the latest version is, was version in. Okay, so there, there are other things that you can do in the database that you probably don't want people doing to your source code repository on a regular basis, but sometimes you really need to do. So this is an example of renaming a, a version in place. Um, this is uh, a, an abbreviated description of how you add support for a, a database function. And this is really changing glorp. This is not a store specific thing. Okay, so this slide I got from Sam Schuster, and he's, he's in his 50s just like me. And so most of you guys probably have never heard of Will Robinson. There was a show in the 60s, 70s, called Lost in Space. And we're not usually lost in space, we're only lost in store. Um, but there was a robot about this tall, and he would go around saying, Danger, Will Robinson, danger. So, so these are traps to avoid in store, and it really applies generally to Glor. You need a session to keep from creating too many objects or spending too, many, too much time deserializing objects. Um, however, if you, if you have too many, you can run out of cursors. If you have too few, the cache can grow to be huge and you can have memory problems. So there's sort of a balancing act and you, you have to sort of look at when am I done with this group of database objects and can I just sort of get rid of all of them. So one of the things that we've done, um, I think mostly in 7.8, is we modified most of the store APIs, which originally looked like this, so that you could cache a session in, and it would reuse that session. Store packages and store bundles have a session instance variable, so that means that if they have parts which are not instantiated, they know how to get to the database and get them. That's how the proxies work. Um, and the other thing is, the thing I showed you earlier, if you just need to know how many packs there are, there's no need to load them all so you can get a count or a timestamp or some other thing like that um, by doing a retrieve query which just gives you back um, an attribute rather than object. Okay, so there were opportunities provided by, by moving to Glorp that were things that people have been waiting 
for, for a long time. Um, schema changes become easier, and we have some schema problems. One schema problem we have is, is that each record for packages and bundles has an attribute which is the key of the previous version. If you want to get a whole chain of versions, um, unless you go out and get everything and then look for the ones you want, this can be um, very inefficient. Um, text fields, like method sources, are stored in blobs, and the blobs are of a fixed size, so they can be continued into chain blobs, and they're two levels away from uh, the method object that, that holds on to them. So these are things that we would have liked to have changed, but because of the hand-coded SQL and the brittleness of the store code generally, um, we really couldn't. Um, at this point, we're ready to do it, um, and, and, but we'll probably be waiting to make major changes until most people have migrated to a version of store that includes Glorp so that we don't leave people out in the cold. Querying the, the repository in complex ways becomes easier. Or we can get small talk objects or objects which represent small talk code from the repository without installing it in our image, and we, and we can do things to it. So, for example, if I wanted to get all the versions of methods that send certain things without having all the code loaded into my image at once, um, it's possible to do that. It's also possible to, I think, run small in on method sources, on methods that aren't actually installed in the image. So this is another thing that I've been thinking about, and, and I have to look at this more, but Glorp has this notion of a descriptor system that maps objects to tables and attributes to instance variables and so on. And right now we have three subclass versions of this that, that basically describe the evolution of store since I think about um, version 7.0 VisualWorks. It seems possible to me that one could compose a descriptor system so that you take our descriptor system and then you add some additional tables and build a descriptor system that sort of glues onto ours. And you can add functionality without having to worry about your code being interspersed with our code and um, then being on center hooks all the time about whether we're going to break what we're doing. Okay, so Glorp opportunities provided by Store. Glorp, one of the problems when I used Glorp as, as a FinCon customer was is I go in and I load Glorp in into VisualWorks and I want to know how to do something and I go searching for senders of some method, it wouldn't be any. Okay, so at this point, FinCon is now a Glorp customer in a sense. We have a real non foy Glorp application and so if, if you want to do something with Glorp, if you have store loaded, you can look at how we're doing these things and see ways, just like you do with most other small talk code. Because we need things, we're liable to spend more time on Glorp features and, and our interests become more aligned with people who are using Glorp. Because the problems that we run into are likely the problems that customers are running into as well. Andrea said that, that I do something with testing. And basically what I do is every week after we do our build, we have about 12,000 tests, and I run those on 14 different OS and hardware platforms. And the first eight are scriptable, and they, they take roughly 24 hours. And then I have three Windows platforms and two Mac platforms that I do afterwards. We use the database in some of the tests on all these platforms.
providing the ability to query the database regardless of the hardware platform and regard uh, for the client and regardless of which database server can save us a lot of time in testing our functionality. And as such, this provides a real motivation for us to do more things, um, to add functionality to Glorp and to become familiar with the lowest common denominator across all the databases. One of the databases that Glorp supports that we don't support and store is MySQL. And the reason is because the keys in indexes in MySQL are limited to about a thousand bytes. And we have indexes on things like versions and there's, there's one with version and something else. I think it might be package name and version. And the problem we have is, is that people like to write long version names. And we can't fit a UTF-8 version name and package name into a thousand bytes. So we may find a way to work around that down the road, but, but for right now that's an example of a place where lowest common denominator functionality, we just had to draw the line. The other thing that, that we were doing is we, we did have a sort of kind of store for Microsoft Access, and with this we sort of looked at it and said, no, I guess I we can't quite think that low. So, and that's not a slam on Microsoft, it's just that the functionality is old, and a lot of the things that most databases do, Microsoft Access just doesn't do. Okay. Um, so, with the migration, with the opportunities, there are some issues. Um, speed is one of the issues. People have complained that stores gotten a lot slower, and it has. Um, and a lot of it is because it's chatty and it's very dependent upon the connection um, response time that you have. Um, so this is, this is how it was before, and people still weren't happy with the speed completely. Um, we think that we can make it faster than the old store in ways that were mentioned by, by David Chisnall in the, um, in the presentation yesterday about pragmatic small talk. The, the algorithm has to change. One of the things, the fastest query you can, you can write is the one that you don't write and you don't send to the database. And we have some that really, really shouldn't go there. So, next slide. Um, we have, we have um, certain queries that were happening every time we created a session that only really needed to happen every time you connected to the database. And there were, there are three of them, and if you create a session just to make one query, but you had three other queries that you had to run, it's clearly much, much slower than it should be. So that's being addressed. Um, the other thing that can happen is you have a query that doesn't quite get all the data that you're going to be using because you're reusing a query that isn't really suited to the purpose that you have now. Um, we ran into a problem where someone was um, they were running a query to get a whole lot, bunch of stuff and then they were looking at it in an inspector. And the inspector wanted to know whether it was loaded into the database. To do that it had to look at a field that had not been brought in and so the result was is that, that we had 30 objects and it was doing a one query per object to find out is this the one that's loaded in the database. So there are places where we're still doing that in, in regular store and we have to make them go away. Um, the other problem that we have is there are occasions where data is retrieved, it's used, it's not held on to, and then we go and get it. So all these are things that have to do with paying 120 milliseconds a pop to do things that maybe we could do much less of. Okay, here's, here's another example of something that, that we're looking at that should reduce a lot of extra processing inside the image. How many of how many Bigworks users here have gone to unload packages and the package just you're just waiting and waiting for it to unload? Okay, so so it turns out that one of the problems is, is that 
when we load code, there are three different change sets that that, that code gets gets um, added to. There's a change set for bundle or package. There's a, there's a global change set, and then there's a name change set. And there is always, even if you're not using a specific name change set, there is a current one. So we think that we can make this one go away, and we think that this one doesn't actually need to hold on to the changes because it's mainly being used as a notification that something has come into the image. So in unloading, that means that we don't, if we can make this go away, then we can just dump the change set for the database for the package that we're unloading. And then we don't have to search the others looking for the pieces that we need to pull out before we can actually take them out of the database. There's also some updating of browsers that as each method is Remove any browsers that are open are updated. And it would really be better if you say, delete package, and it goes click, and you don't have three sets of list panes that have to be updated with every piece that gets removed. Um, okay, so as, as I'm saying here, unloading should be much, much faster, and this should help loading as well. Because loading is just an update, the other one is a search and an update. Okay, okay so in 7.9, all the old store objects and all the old store tools are no longer in the image. If you want them because you have something that you need them for, they're still available and they're, they're in loadable packages, old store database and old store tools. We're working on improving the speed as fast as we can. Um, we have about 200 store publishing tests. These are functional tests that do things like create three versions of a package, and after creating each version, unload them. Then load the first one, check to see that the data is right, load the second one over the top, make it sure that the data is right, and then load the third one, and do the same, and then unload it again. So this is very painful, <coughs> given the, the issues that we have. And so they don't get run as often as they should. We want to run them more often. This is a motivation, and it's also a way that we can see um, how, how the effect that we're having on the speed. One of the problems that I ran into with running the test and when you end up with all the tests that I'm running, it takes about three days total, and there's about 175,000 individual test cases that get run. 12,000 times 14. A problem that I've had is I do this on the weekend. I'm supposed to not be working. And what happens is, or what would happen is, there would be a problem at the store, and I get a dial. And I wasn't looking, I'm not watching, and I'm hopefully doing something fun. And three hours later I come back, or in the morning I get up and I look, and oh, about 15 minutes after I went to bed, this just stopped. So we've gone into store, and we have modified things so that you'll still see the dialogue if you're loading something and there's a problem. But the dialogue is the default response to the exception. If you have something that you want to run, in a room where people don't usually go, you can catch those exceptions and do, do whatever you want with them. So it's not going to stop, um, or you can make it so it won't stop. And so, so that helps me have more of my weekend free. And if you're doing things with building applications in an automated fashion, it also makes that a lot more reliable. Okay, um, we have a merge tool that allows you to have a loaded version and merge a version, a version from the database in and then publish it. The merge tool is being modified in this release to use RB refactoring to apply the changes so that after you do it, let's suppose you apply all the changes, you run all your tests before you publish, and you have some bugs. 
then you decide that rather than going forward, you just want to back it out. You can do that. Um, or you will be able to do that. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we're making it possible to do an automated merge where if all of your changes are like this, if your changes don't conflict and there's no, there are no changes that need to be manually merged, you don't have to wait and watch the window that shows all of those. And I wanted to, um, if you haven't seen this tool, So this is the merge tool, and here's an, here's an example of a method that got added. Here's an example of a method that got removed, and here's an example of a method that got changed. In the upper left-hand corner, there's an Apply All button. If you push that, it applies all the changes, and then it says Publish. Okay, so basically, you, in this particular case, there are no conflicts that have to be manually resolved. So, in the future, if you don't want to see this window, you don't have to. If you have an automated process which can search for manual conflicts and, and only start the merge, if it can be automatically resolved, you don't have to see this window. And ultimately, you won't have to see the publish dialog easy. easy as well, so that in effect you can have scriptable merge and publishes um, for the common cases where there isn't anything that really requires user intervention. Okay. So another thing that we've just been working on is something for SynCon small talk support, but other people who have applications may also find it useful. What, what Gather allows you to do is after you've discovered a bug in your image and you've made the changes to fix it, Gather will allow you to basically pull the changes out and publish them regardless of what package they're in, in a new package. This is a common way for our support engineers to send a patch to a customer. What it then does is when they load that package, it installs the new code as overrides to the, um, to the existing application. How many of you, do you know what I'm talking about with an override? This is a VisualWorks specific thing. Um, is there anyone who does? Let me ask. Not a Not a Oh, okay, okay. So, in VisualWorks Smallbox, you can install, you can have two definitions of the same method in the same class in different packages. If you load one and then the other, the second one will be the one that actually is in effect. But if you want, if then you unload that package, the other one will come back. So basically, this allows the customer to see which code is patch code because it shows differently in the browser, um, and to keep it separate from the application that frequently they tested for months. Um, some customers, however, don't like that because they keep versions of all of our stuff as well as their stuff in a repository. And so they want that all those methods to go back to the place where their their original implementation was. So the distribute functionality allows you to take one of these gathered packages and distribute it back to 